So my name is Gabriel Gasque, and I am head of outreach at Protocols.io. I'm really happy to be here presenting this introduction to Protocols.io webinar. And before we begin, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I have a background in experimental neuroscience. I did a PhD and then postdoctoral training. And before joining Protocols.io as head of outreach, I was an editor in the open access journal PLOS Biology. So I consider my, myself a scientist as well as an advocate for open science, experimental reproducibility, and research integrity. So what you see on the screen now is the agenda. I will be presenting for about 40 to 45 minutes, leaving time at the end for questions, which you can start typing at any moment in the chat or in the Q&A window of Zoom. And we will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. So in this webinar, we will go over some of the more general points in terms of the motivations for creating this platform, Protocols.io, what our mission is, and how the platform and its tools can make your work easier and faster, both in the research lab and in the teaching classroom. We will also talk about the benefits of increasing reproducibility, both inside and outside your own research group. And although I will be sharing a lot of information, we will not have the opportunity to go over all the details of the different functionality of Protocols.io. For that reason, at the end of my presentation, I will share with you some resources that you can browse for more information. But let's begin with defining Protocols.io. So Protocols.io is a virtual platform for the collaborative development, sharing, and publication of detailed, up-to-date, and reproducible experimental protocols before, during, and after publication of a research article. And I have to clarify that the protocols that are published in Protocols.io are not peer-reviewed. So Protocols.io is not a journal, it is a repository, which can be linked to peer-reviewed publications. As, as, you know, as background for the creation of Protocols.io, we have collected a series of tweets that comment on the difficulties and frustrations of trying to replicate previously published experimental work. And as you can read in this example that comes from the field of physics, Daniel goes from reference to reference, trying to understand how certain devices used in a paper from 2017 are fabricated. And when he finally reaches the original publication from 2009, materials and methods simply says, devices were fabricated with conventional methods. And that's all the information he gets. So this is just an example that highlights a widespread problem. That is very often, the information reported or included in the materials and method sections of published articles is insufficient to allow readers to understand what was done and to reproduce the research. As part of the background on why we launched Protocols.io, we also liked to talk about the Cancer Biology Reproducibility Project, which was a $1.5 million initiative coordinated by the Center for Open Science and by Science Exchange with the goal of trying to independently replicate almost 200 experiments from about 50 high profile papers on cancer biology. What the reproducibility project researchers discovered very soon after the project began is that it is very difficult to replicate previously published work. There are several reasons why this is the case, but one of them is that the original researchers didn't document in their articles with enough detail what they did and how they did it. So what you see on the screen is a Center for Open Science website that summarizes some of the results of the reproducibility project. And as you can see, 
of the 193 experiments that they tried to replicate from 53 articles, 0%, 0% of the protocols were completely described, which made it impossible to reproduce them without contacting the original authors. But equally striking, when researchers from the Reproducibility Project contacted the original authors, they also discovered that these did not always could tell how their own experiments had been done. Therefore, the problem of lack of reproducibility goes beyond the lack of adequate reporting in published articles, but also highlights efficiencies in the way researchers keep record of their own research protocols for housekeeping. And this is caused, among other reasons, because people move from labs. So students graduate and leave, postdoctoral researchers become faculty elsewhere, and so on. And traditional paper notebooks can be damaged, easily misplaced, and lost, and are difficult to search to find the most updated version of a protocol. Therefore, we thought that a cloud-based platform for the proper preservation and publication of detailed research protocols was needed. So generally speaking, protocols.io comes into flavors. So we have a completely free open access repository, which provides unlimited publishing of protocols. Each of these public protocols will receive a unique digital object identifier or DOI, making them permanent and citable. It is therefore free to create an account in protocols.io and to publish an unlimited number of protocols. Because the repository is open access, it is equally free to come and read, use, and reuse any and an unlimited amount of public protocols. In addition, we have premium accounts that offer everything the free plan offers, plus an unlimited number of private protocols and workspaces, premium training, and for the institutional accounts, a free protocol import service. So if you are interested, you can find more details about our plans at protocols.io slash plans slash academia. And later on, I will explain what workspaces are and how the protocol import service works. Some of you might already have an institutional premium account if you work for a university that is a partner of protocols.io. So you can check that by, show, by going to protocols.io slash for institutions, scroll down as I'm showing in this movie and search for your institution. So if you create your account using an institutional email address, it will be automatically premium. But I want now to discuss why we think it is productive, time-saving, and rewarding to create, share, and publish detailed experimental protocols in addition to fostering reproducibility. And the key message that I want to convey is that practicing open science, including open methods, is beneficial not only for the extended research community, but also for the individual practitioner. So before we dig in, I want to show you how the protocols created and published in protocols.io go beyond what a traditional static PDF offers. The protocols in the platform are live, dynamic, interactive, yet persistent and citable electronic documents. So I'm gonna be opening one of these protocols, which you now see appearing on the screen. Because the protocol has been published, it has received a DOI, making it both permanent and citable. The protocols themselves are written in a recipe-like, step-by-step -step fashion. They can be enriched or supplemented with images, pictures, tables, and even videos. The protocol, different sections of the protocol can be coded in different colors, creating a table of content. The protocols are versionable, and I can navigate between two versions of the protocol. 
And these are interactive documents because these being a public protocol, any reader can come and post a comment or ask a question and the authors of the protocol will be notified and they can come to the platform to respond to that query. It is also very easy for any reader to create their own editable copy or fork to optimize the protocol for their own particular needs. And the protocol can be run directly from the computer, tablet, or cell phone. So as I make progress in my protocol, sorry, I can mark each step as done. I can see the progress of my experiment here. If I want to add some data to my run or a comment, if I notice something unusual in a step, I can add a comment. And eventually, once I'm done with my experiment, I can save the run with a timestamp as an independent file. But let me go back to the presentation. And while there is a historical bias in favor of protocols in biomedicine, the platform itself is agnostic to the subject area of research. And researchers have begun using it to develop, share, and publish protocols beyond the wet molecular biology lab. So in this slide, I show you just five examples of protocols for archaeology, computational biology, clinical research, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and environmental science. But you can extrapolate the idea to your specific area of research. Again, if I open one of these protocols, in this case is a protocol for archaeology, this is a protocol that describes a method to create representation of lithic tools Again, the protocol is written in a recipe-like, detailed, step-by-step -step fashion. It has images and pictures, has different sections. The authors have created multiple versions, can be copy and fork, and run from the computer or tablet. But let's discuss now why we think it is rewarding to create and publish detailed research protocols. Not necessarily in order of importance, but a first advantage of making your methods public is that by using specialized repositories to publish these protocols, you are increasing the chances that they will be discovered and reused, which should lead to more credit and recognition. So let me use an example here that we took from Twitter, now, L, now X. Uh, you can see here a tweet from a researcher who was looking for a protocol for RNA extraction from primary cortical neurons in culture. Somebody responded to this tweet and recommended a protocol that is in protocols.io. But this protocol was actually part of a paper that was published in the journal Giga Science but the paper was about a fish parasite. So the chances of researchers working on the primary cortical neurons in culture, finding a paper on a fish parasite as a means of finding a method that would work for them seemed to us really slim. But because the protocol was published independently in a specialized repository, it made the method more discoverable and increased the chances of people finding it and reusing it. So Protocols.io started in 2014. We currently have over 174,000 registered users who have created over 16,000 public protocols and over 58,000 private protocols. The protocols, the protocols, sorry, the public protocols as I mentioned before, are all open access, which means they are fully searchable and free to read, use, and reuse. And last year alone, the protocols have over two and a half million readers. 
And once a protocol is published, the document has a tab that is called metrics that shows in real time all traffic and use of the protocol, including number of views, bookmarks, exports, copies, comments, and citation. Another reason to make your protocols public is to guarantee preservation and to facilitate seamless conti continuity of the work inside your research group. As we have discussed, a large fraction of a lab personnel is floating. Publishing the protocols makes them persistent citable objects that will be permanently stored both in your workspace as well as in the open access repository. And I should mention that all public and private content in protocols.io is mirrored and backed up in clocks, GitHub, and the internet archive. And public sharing of protocols also increases the chances of establishing collaborations. As we have seen cases where researchers report that this is the case. And I would like to show you how the common functionality of the platform allows a real-time open scholarly and productive discussion between all parties interested in a particular protocol or method. So what you see on the screen is a particularly popular protocol that has received over 1,200 comments. Because the protocol is public, any reader can come and look at the comments and see the conversation between users of the protocol and the author's response. And we think that this open scholarly communication could potentially lead to collaborations. And managing and publishing your protocols should also simplify your work down the road when the time of submitting and publishing a paper comes. Again, one example from Twitter. Here we have Professor Kipnis at the Washington University in the United States, who, who tweets and says, what if labs publish each of their unique methods and protocols, and in future papers, instead of rewriting the protocols, we just cite them. We waste so much time on methods by saying the same thing differently. And that is exactly what protocols.io is about. You can publish your updated, detailed protocols in the open access repository, obtaining citable DOIs, which both you and your colleagues can cite in their papers, moving away from writing vague method section and creating chains of citation. And this is what the authors of this plus biology paper did. They created, deposited, and published their protocols in protocols.io, obtaining a citable DOI, which they then included in the materials and methods section, replacing most of the writing. The reader, by following the link, has access to the detailed step-by-step -step protocol in protocols.io. And a really nice thing about how protocols.io works is that the protocols are versionable, as I mentioned before. So if the authors have updated their protocols since the time of publication, the reader will be notified and can choose to read the protocol as it was published at the time of publication of the peer-reviewed paper, which is what you see on the screen now, or by following the view newer version link, read the most updated version of that same protocol. And a fifth point would be that by managing, preserving, and storing your protocols in protocols.io, you will be compliant with the NIH data management and sharing policy because methods are always an integral part of data. And the NIH rigor and reproducibility guidelines also explicitly highlights the need for grant applicants to describe details in their applications, which should be considered by reviewers. And as a bonus, by practicing open science and particularly open methods, you increase reproducibility in the field, which you can see as a present from you to your colleagues and extended research community, but also within your own laboratory, which you can see as a gift 
from you to yourself. And in a push to increase transparency, accountability, and reproducibility, several organizations, including over 500 scientific journals, funding agencies, and educational and research institutions in three continents support and promote the use of protocols.io. Now, let me give you a taste of how the platform looks like and how its different functionality allows you to do everything I listed before. Organize and preserve your work, collaborate, save time, increase your reproducibility, impact, and credit. So the platform has three main sections, the workspaces, the file manager, and the editor. And I will explain in the next few slides how they relate to each other by using a simple cartoon. So the workspace is where everything happens. It is the core of your account. It is from this space that you create protocols, organize your work, and collaborate with others. The workspace has a folder that is organized by the file manager. And in the file manager, you can use the editor to create protocols. And I will be moving back and forth between the different, these different sections as I explain what they do. So if you go to our welcome page, that is what you see on the screen. If you have not created an account, you can do so by signing up and that will take you to a login. You can also log in with Google, Facebook or Orchid. Once you start a session, the first step is to create a workspace. The system will also ask you if you want to invite someone to join this new workspace, but it is not mandatory that you, are, that you add collaborators to a workspace. Once in the workspace, you will have access to the file manager, which is now empty because the workspace is new. To the left, you have access to the workspace administration menu. And to create a new protocol, you select the new button, which will take you to the editor. Now the file manager will eventually contain, display and organize the protocols that you have created within that workspace. The file manager supports any file types, so you can create protocols with the editor, but you can also bring PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents. It helps you archiving, auditing, and exporting because it can connect to Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive, and it has been designed with enterprise-grade security and backup functionality, as I mentioned before. Now, the editor has detailed components, a granular editing history that allows all changes to be reverted. It also allows the editor concurrent editing by two or more collaborators, the same way that two or more people can work simultaneously on a Google document. The protocol itself, has, as I have shown you before, is written in a step-by-step -step recipe like format and different sections of the protocol can be coded in different colors. Now going back to the workspace, this is a space for collaborations. You can invite anyone to join your workspace. It can be a student or postdoc, another faculty member within the same institution or external collaborators. To invite a collaborator, you go, as I will show you in this movie, you go to the administration menu of your workspace. You select manage members, and then you can invite people, anyone, by typing their email address. To join, they will have to create an account, but as I mentioned before, creating an account in complete, is completely free. You can make your workspace, or more than one, public, meaning that it will be searchable and people can request to join, or you can make it completely private, which is the default setting. You can also manage the privileges that members of that workspace will have and limit what they can do, such as inviting other members or sharing, deleting, or publishing protocols and files from the workspace folder. Workspace members can comment, 
on the protocols that you have created and share with them through the file manager. They can also make changes to those protocols. And as I mentioned before, there is a detailed log of all implemented changes, which can be reverted if needed. So there is a historical record of the editing process of the protocol. Members of a workspace can also create protocols and save them in the file manager, or take an existing protocol, make a fork or editable copy, and modify it and optimize it according to their own very specific needs. And the platform allows you to compare two versions or two forks of the same protocol. In this case, I'm going to be comparing two versions of this protocol. And the platform automatically detects the changes uh, between the two versions of this protocol. And even if a member of your workspace leaves, because for example, somebody graduated, the protocols will remain organized, up to date, and available in the file manager. You can select to print your protocol or export it as a PDF to Google Drive, Dropbox, or OneDrive. So just to orient ourselves, to the left, you see all the protocols to which I belong. Some of these protocols were created by me. In others, I had been invited as a member. We are gonna be working on my private protocol. So if I want to export a protocol, I select the protocol that I want to export. I can export it as a PDF to my computer or to any of these cloud-based drives. I'm exporting it to my computer. The platform is creating the PDF. And now I can print it to have a hard copy at my bench while I'm running my experiments. So we have talked about collaboration within our workspace. But you can also collaborate beyond the workspace by sharing your protocols, specific protocols, with specific people via email or by publishing them. Again, I select the protocol that I want to share. I click the share button. And now by typing their email address, I can add collaborators, not to my workspace, but to these very specific protocols. And once I share and I add collaborators to this protocol, I can control what these collaborators can do with the document. In this case, Lenny, Nastya, and Emma are editors, but Daniel is just a viewer of my protocol. Now, publishing your protocol will assign to it a DOI and will allow anyone with an internet connection to search for it either via Google or directly into the platform and to access the protocol. It will also create a log that will not allow further changes to the protocol. So to create persistency, once a protocol has received a DOI, is not editable anymore. It has to be versioned. A published protocol with an assigned DOI is a citable object that can be referenced to in a paper giving credit to the author's methodological work. And the protocol or the reference will be linked to the protocol in protocols.io. So the reader has access to the interactive step-by-step -step protocol, even if the paper was published behind a paywall, because all of our content is open access, the public content. Once a protocol is published, any reader can use it as a template create their own editable fork and modify it according to their very specific needs. And the platform keeps a, hist a credit line 
that will link any forked protocol to the original one. In this way, both creation and optimization maintain and earn credit. So in this example, we have a protocol that is a modified and optimized version of an original protocol created by somebody else. There is an indication in the platform that says that this protocol was forked from a different protocol, which the reader can access by following the link. So the authors, all authors, earn credit for creation and optimization, and the reader has access to the history of changes and evolution of the protocol. And Protocol Zorayo recently established a partnership with PLOS One and other journals, including BMC Methods and Nature Protocols, whereby you can submit from our platform a novel protocol for peer review and eventual publication in any of these journals. Now, the partnership we have with PLOS One is very specific because the position of the protocol in Protocol Zorayo it's a requirement for publication. The published lab protocol in PLOS One will be bidirectionally linked to the interactive and dynamic protocol in Protocol Zorayo. And the protocol in Protocol Zorayo gets an additional badge that says that the protocol has been peer reviewed and published as a paper in PLOS One. Now, going back to the workspace. Any user can create multiple workspaces in their accounts, depending on their research or teaching needs. You can create workspaces for different research projects or to teach different courses. Some of these can be public, some of these can be private. Each workspace can have different members and contain different protocols and documents, giving you great flexibility for organization. Now, I do appreciate that most of you already have existing digital protocols in different formats, like PDFs or Word documents. So in this finishing part of the presentation, I will do a short demo to show you how you can easily bring these existing protocols into the platform. I will be a start uh, by describing the easiest and quickest way and then moving down to the most sophisticated one that is also the most time consuming. And then I will describe the import service that we offer. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. And I will reshare my screen. So again, I'm going to go to my file manager. There is a, an empty folder here that is called demo, and I'm going to open my hard drive. So you see here that there are three protocols in different formats in my hard drive. One is a doc document, a Word doc. Another one is a PDF and then a plain text. The easiest way to bring these protocols into the platform is just to take them and track them. The protocols have been copied. Now I'm centralizing everything methods related in a single platform. I can share any of these protocols as I showed you before with a specific collaborations and any member of my file ma manager of my workspace will have access to those documents as well. However, because these are not protocols created with the editor, these are documents in their original format, I cannot publish any of these protocols. Therefore, I cannot cite them. The easiest way to create a publishable document out of these existing electronic files is to create with the editor an empty protocol and just attach any of these documents. So to do that, this is the second way. I go to the editor, I create a new protocol. 
What I'm seeing now is the editor. I select a template. Now I can add a title to my protocol. And if I eventually decide to publish it, having a title will make the protocol more discoverable. I should also add an abstract for the same reasons. Protocols in protocols.io are indexed in Google Scholar. So having an abstract make them more discoverable as well. Now, rather than creating a steps as traditionally is done, in the description tab, I scroll down all the way to the bottom, and there's a window for me to attach a, the protocol that I want to publish. Let's say is a PDF. I drag it here. The PDF has been attached. I can go to the viewer. And now my protocol has a title, has an abstract, and it doesn't have the steps, but the protocol itself is attached as a PDF. Now, because it is a protocol created with the editor, I can publish it and assign to it a DOI. I can also submit it to peer review to the three options that I mentioned before, BMC methods, nature protocols, or plus one. However, because there are no steps and the content is encapsulated in this attachment, this is not an interactive and dynamic document. It's publishable, but it's not interactive or dynamic. So let's see how we can create an interactive and dynamic document out of an existing protocol. So I'm going to go back to the editor. Now, this only works for text documents. It doesn't work for PDFs, unfortunately. I can open the protocol that I want to import. Let's open the Word document. So you can see the protocol here as a title, app, you know, authors, an abstract, and then the steps of the protocol begin. If I go back to the editor, instead of adding the steps and retyping everything, down here, if it's not too small for you to see, it says here, insert a step from a text file. So I can click that. This window opens. I select the steps that I want to insert. There is a typo here, but don't mind it. Now, these steps in the text file have been transformed in the steps in the editor. I can even add the section title, and I can keep doing that for every section with its steps and so on. Now, if I go to the viewer, now the protocol has a steps. And because it has a steps, it is interactive, accepting comments, and can be run from the computer and tablet. So three ways for you to create protocols out of existing electronic documents. Now, let me stop sharing again for a bit. And I'm going to share again. Now, the fourth step here, or the fourth point, we also offer an import service by which you can send us your protocol in any format, and our team of editors will create the dynamic interactive document, taking advantage of the functionality of the components for you. Now, this service has a cost. However, it is free for faculty and students and staff working at an institution that has a premium license of protocols.io. If you wish to send us your protocol, you can do so 
in the URL at the bottom of the slide, protocols.io slash we enter protocols. Now, I hope you to have provide enough information uh, to persuade you that by using protocols.io, you can stay organized, collaborate efficiently, save time, increase your impact and get credit. Now, I know that I have given you a lot of information that you might need time to digest. I also want to mention that we have other resources for information. So this is an introduction to protocols.io webinar, but we schedule three webinars a month at different time zones. And you can sign to these webinars for free and you can see the ones, if you scroll down, you can see the ones coming up, coming up next. We also have a series of um, uh, you can view past webinars and you can always request a one-to-one -one demo. And in these demos, you will be talking privately with one of our, our specialists to discuss any question that you might have about the platform. You can share your screen, they can share your screen and have a very interactive and hopefully constructive discussion. Now with that, I will be happy to take any questions that you might have. And I see that there are already two typed. Okay. And then, so Victor Brito, writes whether there is an app for smartphones or tablets or whether it can only be accessed from the web browser and it can only be accessed from the web browser. We don't have an app yet. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. I'm going to stop recording in case somebody wants to ask a question of the record.